Hello, Warfare class, and welcome to another week's worth of stuff. We're going to be talking about the third Persian invasion and using that as a jumping off point to talk about naval design and tactics in the 5th century BCE, loosely organized around the third Persian invasion. So we're going to start off with the Battle of Thermopylae first, though, because this is an invasion that happens both on land and on sea. So you see where I'm going with this. This invasion kicks off in 481, but it's really boiling during 480. Uh, 481, Xerxes is mustering his troops and getting things together. 480, the crossing is made from modern day Turkey, the Anatolian Peninsula, over the Hellespont, this narrow channel of water where the red line is going here, leading to the Black Sea. Now, as we mentioned last week, this is a problematic crossing and one that Persia's had problems with in the past. Now, they did make it once before with the first disastrous Persian invasion. You may remember this one as the one that ends in a uh, sinking. Second Persian invasion, they opt for an island hopping approach, which works as well as it could, but the Allies see them coming far off. They can't bring as many people as they want to, and it ends up not being enough to properly sack Athens, let alone Athens and Sparta and their allies. And you see where we're going with this. So this time Xerxes decided to make a little bit more effort, put together a larger force. Herodotus gives us numbers that are a little um, implausible. So suffice it to say that there are just a lot of Persians in this. Not just a land army, but an entire naval flotilla too, and not just a support flotilla that's conveying the Persian um, cavalry and archers from one place to another, which seems to be what's going on with the landing at Marathon. Rather, this is a full-on um, attack fleet. In other words, the, the ships are made for active ship-on-ship -ship engagements and not just for carrying men and materials. So we are now looking at the overland and overseas map of two parallel invasion routes. Uh, you see a dashed line and a solid line going from Sardis, the capital of ex-Lydia, now the satrapy of Lydia, into the Greek mainland. This is a pretty clever move on Xerxes' part. His land army has support by sea, and you'll notice the ships are going along the coastline very close to the army. This means they can carry extra supplies and material and continue to relieve the troops on land. Uh, they can also watch the coast and move ahead a little bit to see what's coming up next. So it works both as a um, scouting and support flotilla, but also they're looking to engage the Athenian navy, which has grown in the years since Marathon. Marathon was a bit of a wake-up call. Athens won, yes, but they took this as an opportunity to build a whole lot of ships. They, they argue about it as Athenians do, but suffice to say, uh, the let's build some ships people win on this this one. So the Athenian navy has gotten huge, and even Sparta has a navy at this point, which is super impressive because Sparta was landlocked and not really into naval warfare as such, but they had some ships. Also, many allies had been roped into this effort now. So Athens and Sparta's support had maybe not been all it could be during the invasion that ended in Marathon, the second Persian invasion of the 490s. But by the 480s, Greece knew that Persia, yes, was actually going to invade and that they were not going to be treated particularly well. Before them is the example of what happened to Babylon when Cyrus invaded. They had resisted Persian invasion and they, like others who resisted, could expect to have uh, not particularly favorable treatment. Now, this is not to say that everybody in the Greek mainland was willing to go team Hellene. A lot of them medized, that is, they joined Persia. 
a lot of people who did join Persia from the Greek mainland didn't have a lot of choice about it. The Allies weren't making any effort to defend, for instance, the plain of Thessaly. We'll be looking at that in more detail coming up. Thrace, of course, was already part of the Persian Empire at this point. You may remember their Peltasts. They're still on Team Persia. So areas like um, Thebes, for instance, which had never liked Athens much to begin with, was leaning Persian. Of course, some Thebans were not leaning Persian. It's complicated and we can't get into the political realities, but if you're interested, you may want to take either our Ancient Greeks course or Finn's upper level Greek history course, both of which are well worth your time and we'll get into the politics here. But we're talking military logistics. So the land army has sea support. The sea, on the other hand, can count on land support too so that people on land are able to interfere with the launching of ships and launching was done mostly from land in these areas because the Mediterranean's Mediterranean is infested with a boring wood-eating worm. Ships left in the water of the Mediterranean are consumed pretty quickly and that's a huge investment to build one of these ships of the period, the trireme. So ships were often kept out of the water as much as possible, you know, damp enough that their wood had kept its seal, but then you would launch it into the sea in time to go out and meet an oncoming force. So if you had a land army with scouts, you could head off some of the resistance by sea, although not all. But it's also a necessity because the resistance is trying to block the Persian advance with both a blockade by sea and a blockade by land. Now, at this point, it was pretty clear to the allies defending Greece that the Persian army, as it existed crossing over the Hellespont, was way too large to win in open combat that in order to get their act together in time to drive the Persians back, they needed to buy, buy time, slow the Persians down, secure their allies, and win a battle of attrition. Because here's the problem Xerxes has to contend with from day one, and the reason why our first two invasions didn't start with massive, massive armies. It has to do with food. You have to, at a certain point, either maintain a massively long supply chain all the way from Persian territory. And you have to do this across the Aegean Sea, which as we discovered in the first Persian invasion is unreliable. Or you have to maintain it over land, which is also unreliable because the straits leading into the Black Sea are treacherous and full of tidal swirls. So your alternative is to raid as you go, to eat the food around the area where your army is. But if you go that route, you can't just stick around for very long because you're going to run out of food. And there are reports of this army moving through like a locust flock where they would just descend on the land and eat everything and raid everybody around them and grab their livestock and their chickens. And everything. This, by the way, is still a a part of warfare today, supply chains are a vital and necessary part of a viable and successful invasion. And this is something that Xerxes, even though he does a pretty good job of thinking this through, and I think the Greek criticism tends to be a little hard on Xerxes, he has a decent plan here keeping the Navy close, maintaining a nice fast pace, moving from allied territory into the South. It's smart, it all makes sense. And the other thing that makes Xerxes bid a little bit smarter than it might appear in hindsight is that he is fully aware that the Greek allies don't get along very well as a political unity that in fact time is as much against them as it is for them. And we're going to see this in the Battle of Salamis. In the Battle of Salamis, uh, Themistocles, the Athenian commander with the Athenian fleet, ends up tricking the Persians into attacking because he knows that his allies are about to like pull up their anchors and sail off to protect their homes in the south. 
this is the problem with defining yourselves around the sovereignty of the city state is that the city states are sovereign and they can decide that you know what we actually don't want to keep athens from getting taken over by persia and leave which almost happens here and that's part of what xerxes is trying to do and trying to do quite cleverly another very smart move xerxes makes is that he puts onto his war council amongst his anatolian and um persian advisors quite a number of displaced people from the greek heartland including the ex-king of sparta not leonidas uh, he's still in sparta at this point but a guy named meritus he'd been kicked out of sparta for reasons and xerxes was like hey move into Persia. We have nice food. You can hang out with us. We're super cool, actually. And Demeritus gets there and he's like, oh my God, this is so much better than Sparta. You guys really do have good food and you don't make us sleep in barracks all the time. And gee, we can be nice to our kids because Sparta is horrible, a horrible place to live. And this is one of Sparta's biggest problems is that as soon as Spartans figure out that they can leave, they do. Awkward. So at any rate, Demeritus is on Xerxes' council, giving him local tips and advice about the Spartans at Marathon, and he's somebody to watch for when you go to read Herodotus. All of this put together meant that Xerxes really had a chance here. So let's look at how this rolled out for both Xerxes and the hoplite phalanx that manages to slow him down just enough that, you know, this invasion doesn't go well for Persia. The first barrier that Xerxes has to cross is the Hellespont. As I mentioned earlier, the Hellespont is this strait of waters going between the Black Sea and the Aegean Sea. It's between modern day Turkey and modern day Greece, um, and more Turkey because Istanbul is in Turkey and right across. Okay, so this was taken during the ancient studies trip to Turkey back in 2015, which is so fantastic, guys. You should go to Turkey if you can go. It is amazing. The cats are adorable there. Also, the antiquity is fantastic. Like, really, 10 out of 10 would go again. So this was taken looking down the Hellespont. So we're looking out onto the Mediterranean Sea. On our left, you can see just there in the coast, it was very misty that day, but the promontory of Abydos, this is the narrowest point across the Hellespont. Sestos on the other side has the Europe part of the Eurasian continent, Asia on the other side. So this was the area that Xerxes chose for his pontoon bridge. I've been a little bit um, puckish here and called this the pontoon bridge of hubris, as Herodotus does. Herodotus implies the, and also, if you read the Persians for Tragedy Week, you'll see this there too. Both authors imply that Xerxes is going against nature by connecting Europe and Asia, and that this was some huge offense against the gods, and that's why the gods were pro-Greece in this war. It's a thing that gets into the record, partly because our best records for this particular war they're all Greek. In fact, and as far as I'm aware, pretty much all of the records of this are Greek, in part because Persia doesn't want other Persians talking that much about the time that they didn't successfully invade Greece, but also because to the Persians, it just, it was a big deal, but it wasn't the biggest deal. It's not even the biggest Persian failure in the last hundred years or so. It's embarrassing yeah but persia cuts its losses moves back and then starts playing political games to destabilize the ever divided hellenes so uh it's not something that they're sitting around kicking themselves for year after year after year but in greece it's a big deal because they beat persia so they're much more excited about it so those are the records we have okay 
So pontoon bridges are bi bridges built on ships, and it's a very clever way to create a temporary passage across water. If you don't build this bridge, you're either going to have to go overland all the way around the Black Sea, which is just prohibitive, that, that dog ain't going to hunt, or you can move everybody across in individual boatloads, but that, that's also difficult. However, this is not an easy place to just put a bridge onto ships because this is a very narrow strait with a lot of water running through it and the tide makes it reverse course back and forward as the day goes on, which means that there's strong undertow pulling on the ships that your bridge is resting on. Now, ships are a great thing to use for the base of the bridge because ships are shaped in order to minimize the amount of water drag on the ship's hull. But it's tricky. The ships, if they're tossed about too much, bump into each other, cause damage. The sh bridge can break beneath them. People can fall off. You know, it's a risky proposition. And Xerxes has a lot of trouble with this. For the first few days, the weather won't cooperate. The water won't cooperate. According to legend, and you, know, you can take this with several grains of salt, uh, Xerxes at this point sends his henchmen down to the Hellespont to whip it until it obeys him. This is probably Greek, Greek propaganda. It certainly sounds kind of badass, but uh, not likely Xerxes just waited until a day where the water was calm enough. And he did manage to move a pretty darn massive land army across this pontoon bridge. It worked. Th this was not a bad idea. Gold star Xerxes. So the first bit of land not immediately occupied by uh, Persian allies starts in the plain of Thessaly. And to understand why Thessaly wasn't a part of the Greek defense plan, we need to look at the geography. And you can see it here a little bit on this topographical map. As you look down, you can see that there's this flat lowland with these crinkly mountains all around it in this bowl shape. That's essentially what this is. This used to be a lake bed and the water drained out of it years and years ago. We'll look at the land that shows where this happens. Geologically, it's a really neat area. But this means that there is no really great way to stop a large Persian army moving through here. It's a great place to raise horses, but these mountains don't have any single blockable pass. They're very porous. And also, to, to effectively wall off any few of the key passes, you would need a lot of hoplites and it wouldn't last long. It, it, this just doesn't make, a, make sense as a defense point. So the Greek allies decided that they were going to just phone it in on Thess Thessaly. They didn't have enough time to make it up there anyway. So instead, they're going to use Thessaly as a bit of a speed bump. This is a place where the Persians are going to have to hang out for a minute. It's a place where locals can make that a little bit harder. And the hope is that this will whittle away some of Xerxes' forces. And it kind of works. Definitely works when we get up to Thermopylae. So as we talked about last week, this is a time when it's good to talk about Hellas. Like, who counts as Hellas, as Greece? Who counts as a barbarian? This is a really contested area. A lot of Greeks thought that people from Thessaly, like people from Thrace, weren't really Greek. A lot of locals thought that, no, we're our kind of Greek, but also not. But then, too, this is an area that ended up joining with Xerxes in this conflict, in part because they were very smart. They didn't have any useful geography for defending the area. Here we are looking across the plain of Thessaly. You can see what I mean. It's a flat open bowl with mountains with multiple large valleys that are pretty easy to penetrate and move around through. There, there just isn't a great way of maintaining this line. So in comes Xerxes and out go the um, 
those who want to join the Greek allies, but most people just stuck around and put up with it and were fine. No. Now, to the Greek allies, these people were medizing, right? They were joining the Persians against other Greek speakers. They weren't like real Hellenes. But we, sh we shouldn't mistake this for a majority Greek idea about Greekness and who is in and who is out, because this is a conversation controlled in large part by Athens and Sparta, mostly Athens. And the records we have of this conflict have a lot to do with Athenian sponsorship and uh, narrative control. Let's just keep that one in mind. Now, I mentioned that this is an area that used to be a lake that had drained. Here at Metera, this is on the, the southern end of the plain of Thessaly, you can see the rock formations that resulted from the water flooding out of this lake at the, the end of the last ice age. So these tall outcroppings of rock that have been smoothed around into these um, deep, almost U-shaped valleys, and it looked kind of like, um, you know, it, snaggle teeth sticking up more than traditional mountain peaks. And this is part of the problem, because you can march your army, say, through here, or through here, or through here, or, well, there are actually two valleys coming in from here, so you can march them either way. And this isn't really easy ground to defend either. Today, there are monasteries on the top of many of these rocks, not because it's easy land to defend, because it's hard land to get into. I mean, yeah, you could sit on the top of this rock and be pretty safe, but people can't come in from the countryside to this rock. Even today, they lift people up in ski lifts. It's uh, not the kind of useful, slow, gradual slope you get in a proper mountain. Which is all to say, uh, this isn't a great point to put your... Um, last ditch Persia delaying army instead. Oh, sorry, here's another view of Metera from the other side. So here you can see what I mean by the valleys being very difficult to block. And this isn't even one line. These pegs of mountaintops continue through. And there's also a lot of cover here. So not only is it hard to defend, but it's really easy to sneak extra people in through. Yeah. Well, this is nightmare tactical to ground. Which brings me to the, well, not really plain, the Pass of Thermopylae. Now, Thermopylae isn't a mountain pass in the way you may be used to thinking of mountain passes, where you have one mountain and then another mountain, and then in between there's like a valley. This isn't that. Rather, at this point on the Greek mainland, the mountain ranges come right up to the sea almost, and then there's an alluvial plain, we're looking at the modern plain of Thermopylae here, that slowly slopes into the sea. Now today the sea is pretty far away from the site of Thermopylae because this is an area with a lot of erosion over time. And erosion has silted up the bottom land quite extensively. Back in the day, the sea would have looked more like this where the sea is coming right up to the shore. The shore is cliff faces going into this bit of calm water between Euboea, this long island off the coast of Greece, and the Greek mainland proper. Now, Euboea also means that there's a breakwater here, and that's important. If you're, say, leading a naval invasion, you want to get your ships back in here because they'll be protected from that sea that you know sank the first Persian invasion there's breakwater, storms blowing in are going to be as disruptive. This is the channel you want to get into. Thermopylae, we're going to focus on the land battle, but keep in mind there's also a sea battle happening at the same time off Cape Artemisium. So there is both a sea effort to block the Persian fleet and a land effort to slow the Persian army. At this moment, Sparta sends 300 soldiers and also a bunch of allies. In fact, there are a lot more allies than there are Spartans, but some for some reason, it's the Spartans we remember. 
Now, interestingly, this attack is happening at the same time that Marathon did back in 490, and the same awkward conversation ensued, where Athens is like, uh, hey, Sparta, Persia showing up, maybe you want to show up too this time? And Sparta's like, oh, crap, it's the Carnea again, it's our festival, like, we, we're not supposed to send an army because the moon is still waning, but the thing that's different here is that Sparta has heard Athens going on and on and on for the last 10 years about how they didn't show up to Marathon and they're sick of it, damn it. So they get around this by saying, okay, so an unauthorized group of 300 of our troops are going to march north and hold the pass and that's our compromise. So this is how we end up with 300 Spartans going north to Thermopylae. Now, Thermopylae is a really good choice if you are an expert hoplite phalanx trying to defeat a large heterogeneous Persian force full of Xerxes' finest, but also many, 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 many troops from all over the known world. And this is because you have a very narrow strip of land with really good visibility and a slight rise that already has some gates. They need a little bit of rebuilding, but they have enough time to do that, and they do. So there are fortifications that, in combination with a regularly rotated hoplite phalanx, can block the Persian advance quite effectively, because no matter how many Persians there are, only so many of them can fill up this space at one time. And even if that's several deep in Persian archers, they're still at range, and you can't extend that range very much. So your archers have to get up so close, and they have to have so many arrows. And as long as you can keep the Persians hanging out there, the more you're going to weaken them, because every day they're there, they're running out of food. And also, the downside to having an army made up of tributes and levies is that not everybody really wants to be there. Certainly not a lot of them are there because they have a particular grudge against Greece. I mean, they like Xerxes just fine, but there's only so much you're willing to like Xerxes when you're being picked off one by one by one by one, and you're running out of food and everything sucks, and you kind of get the point here. So here's another artist recreation of the ancient plain of Marathon, now populated with very bad CGI spears. So you can see what this would look like from the Greek front line here. So they're able to maintain a deep and narrow phalanx that can be refreshed pretty easily. Uh, the hoplite phalanx isn't the easiest troop formation to rotate people in and out of, but the folks there are some of the best trained and uh, the closest to the to professionalization that you get at this period in late archaic Greece that is Sparta and for all I've given Sparta a lot of grief for some really um, counterproductive social engineering they did field a very well trained army that spent most of its time as a professional military at great expense to other citizens in Sparta, mind you, but yay for that. And here is our over map, overhead map, as promised, looking down on the area of Thermopylae and Euboea as well. Now, as I mentioned, Euboea serves as a breakwater area for storms blowing in off the sea and the Athenians are stationed let me try to use purple here let's see if this shows up eh, not great nope okay we'll go back to red so the Athenians are blockading this narrow spit going into the waters between Euboea and the Greek mainland now if the Persians had been able to get back into these waters they would have effectively blunted Sparta's ability to block the Persian onslaught. They could have take, taken troops, sailed them 
over here, landed them, and then gotten around the back of the Spartans. So in order for the Spartans to successfully hold off the Persians here at Thermopylae, the fleet had to be redirected, which is exactly what happens. So the Athenians form an effective blockade, and the Persian fleet starts to make a detour. They do what they had been trying to avoid doing, and they sail along the outer side of Euboea, hoping against hope that there will be no storm. Guess what happens? Uh, yes, um, the Persian fleet is wrecked, there's a storm, and they're scattered and they have to reform. Now, so is the Athenian fleet. They have a really hard time reconfiguring, getting their butts in gear, and then back to Athens. So this messes with everyone, but it does really help Sparta out. This makes Sparta's battle into just land battle, so nice. The other advantage, and this allows Sparta to hedge its bets a little bit, Thermopylae is in this little sub-gulf area here where the water bends inward a bit, so there, there also isn't a really good place to land along these cliffs, and it's a pretty sharp drop off. So even if sun ships do manage to support the Persians, it's going to be kind of hard to land them around the Spartans back in an effective way. So this works out well. The Persians are indeed having some trouble getting through the Spartan blockade until, unfortunately, a local comes to Xerxes and lets him know about this nifty back path that you can get enough troops on to come around the backside of the Spartan phalanx and to attack them on two fronts. This is pretty much kryptonite to a hoplite phalanx. They're really great at frontal assaults and they can even curve a little bit, but you can't form an effective gap-free shield wall on two sides. I mean, you kind of can if you get up next to each other's back, but then you're being pushed into each other, and that's not an effective way to form a shield wall. But the Spartans have some warning. They know that they've been sold out, well, the Spartans and everybody else. So they allow people to leave who want to leave. The Spartans send some of their own people as messengers. This ends really sadly for some of them. Um, they're shamed for surviving this last stand and and their lives quite sadly. <sighs> yeah, that's not cool, guys. That's not cool. But Leonidas does indeed fall at the end, uh, backed up onto a hillside, and the Spartan land army continues on through the path you see here, marching through Thebes, where there are enough friendlies that they can stop and rest a little bit, and then right on into Athens, which they then proceed to sack. Meanwhile, their fleet has reformed, gotten its act back together, and they catch up, sailing around, as they always intended to, on the leeward side of Euboea, into Salamis. So here's a topographical map showing the final stages of the Battle of Thermopylae. So A is the Phocaean Wall. This is that wall that the Spartans repair and defend for most of the battle. And then at the very end, they withdraw to this uphill area that lets them keep their backs sort of to the mountain, which is the best that you're going to do in this situation. And there it is. It's over. The Persians make it through. Their navy eventually gets back behind Euboea, and they continue their advance on Athens. And it looks pretty bad, actually, once the, the Battle of Salamis heats up. Not quite done yet, though, because these are some of the many, many, many remains that date to about the time of the Battle of Thermopylae that have been excavated on the battlefield at Thermopylae proper. You see a few longer spear points here, but many, 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 many arrowheads. Um, this 
backs up at least part of Herodotus's claim that the Persian eras were so thick they blotted out the sun. That's believable. It's an effect that happens in battles with large massed archery corps, and Persia was nothing if not well supplied with archer corps. And this is something that leads to one of the more badass moments in Herodotus, where apparently the Spartans are told that, oh, you know, the arrows are so thick, they'll blot out the sun. And the Spartans were like, oh, awesome, we get to fight in the shade. That's a good one. Grudging admiration. Thermopylae today, as I mentioned, is much more silted in. So here is the war monument. Uh, this is a modern monument set on uh, the site about where the old Phocaean wall used to be. And then out there where the tractor is, that would have been C back in the um, early 5th century BCE. And the statue of Leonidas is also modern, but it's pretty, it's scenic. And then the hill on which the Spartans made their last stand also has a modern reconstructed monument too, but there was an ancient monument as well. And the inscription was preserved in Herodotus so that when the new monument was put together, the ancient inscription was recast and put up. So uh, the item on which the inscription appears is not ancient, but this is what was on the war marker back in the fifth century. Here we are then. Um, I'm going to let you read the English, although for accessibility, here we go. So this says, foreign guest, send the message to the Lacedaemonians that here we lie, still obeying their orders. Oxen, angelen Lacedaemoniois, hotitede, kemeta tois kenon remasi pethomenoi. Which is just really good. This is one of my favorite inscriptions of all time. In... Because I've talked a lot of smack about Spartans, but this is a really brave moment. Because here we have a group of soldiers who are willing to put their bodies and their lives on a suicide mission in a delaying action that they had no guarantee would end in glory, in part because they believed it was this important to protect Greece from Persian orders. But then also the fact that they are still there is true. The Spartans were buried right where they lay. And this is not just a war memorial, but a grave marker. So not only were the Spartans still there, still obeying orders, but they still are. And that's, uh, you know, I, I can't help but be moved by that. Next up, the Battle of Salamis. So when we last left them, the Persians had made it through the Spartan blockade and the Athenian blockade. Their ships and their land army had marched southwards and they get all the way to Athens this time. They invade the city, they burn it down, they go onto the Acropolis and they bust up all of the temples. And this is not up for debate. We found the rubble of the archaic Parthenon. So we found the evidence of this in the archeological records. So this was just devastating. The entire city of Athens was burning. Every nice building in the entire area had been razed. Persia made a point of lowering Athens to the ground, which is extreme in terms of ancient invasions. Generally speaking, you want to keep the city around so that you can use it again later. But at this point, Persia was a little irritated with Athens. So uh, yeah, down goes the city. And the Athenian resistance no longer had a city for their city-state. They had boarded the fleet, evacuated women and children to the island of Salamis, which is what you're looking at here. This is an island out in the harbor of Athens. So on the 
shore here, this is the mainland, it's the very outskirts of the port of Athens, the Piraeus. We'll look at this from inside the city of Athens later so you can get a sense of scale, but it's close enough that the evacuees from Athens on the island of Salamis could look out and see their home burning. So this isn't like too long away, this is right in eyeshot. And at this moment, other Greek allies were looking at Athens burning and they were thinking about their homes that were further south of Salamis. And keep in mind that Athens is on this promontory right before you get to the Straits of Corinth, or not the Straits of Corinth, sorry, the um, Isthmus of Corinth, this very narrow strip of land, and then the southern part of the Greek mainland, the Peloponnese. And the allies from the Peloponnese and Corinth are thinking, oh God, they're coming to burn us next. Our people are at home and we're here on our boats what are we defending? Let's sail out of here. And that is a sensible tactical decision to make. But the Athenians are really worried at this point because their support is disintegrating and their city is gone. And the only prayer they have of getting their city back in some form is by engaging the Persians at Athens and somehow managing to drive them out of the city. That's a tall order at this point, and things do not look good for the Greeks. Ah, but then Themistocles, who is the commander elected by the Athenians to lead the Athenian navy at this point, comes up with a ruse. Uh, he sends one of his enslaved functionaries to the Persians to fake defect and tell the Persians, uh, hey, the the Greek allies are leaving now. If you hurry up, you might catch them before they leave. So the Persians rush into attack really fast, thinking that the Allied navy is leaving, which in fact they kind of are. But this means for Themistocles that his navy can't get away now and they have to actually fight the Persians, which is a bold move. We're going to look at a tactical map in a minute. So this promontory here off of Salamis and this island are important parts of this engagement. The Persians station men on this island, Svitalea, in the expectation that Greeks are going to abandon their ships and try to swim for dry land. And when they fetch up on this island, the Persian soldiers can then kill the semi-drowned Greeks. This promontory, however, obscures the inner area between the island of Salamis and the Athenian mainland from the view of the open sea. So as the Persians are sailing up here, they can't tell where exactly the fleet is. So there is a group of ships here in this little nook waiting. There are also Greek defenders here and here. Xerxes, however, is not an idiot and he sends another detachment of his fleet, uh, the Egyptian detachment, around the other way to block the Greek allies in the harbor. So on paper, at least, he's doing exactly what he just did at the Battle of Thermopylae. He's coming at the Greeks from two sides. He's going to pincher them together and eat them all for lunch. Um, okay, let's see how that worked out for him. Before we do, though, this was taken on an overcast day from Lukavatos, this high hill in uh, downtown Athens. So we're looking out now to the harbor and then right over here you can see a little bit of water here and then that's the island of Salamis. So Athens city limits-ish about like in here and then the island of Salamis is here so you could definitely see this burning back in the day. It would have been really spectacular. Okay. So here's the aforementioned tactical map. So the Egyptian contingent is sailing off into the Gulf to black, block the back passageways. So this is labeled, yeah, so the full Persian fleet splits here with the Ionian fleet here. Remember, Ionians speak Greek. They're from Ionia, which is in Anatolia, but they're Greek speaker, yeah. So this is in part a Greek speaker on Greek speaker naval battle, but also Phoenicians. And Phoenicians were the masters of the sea at this point in 
points subsequent. They were early perfectors of naval technology and naval warfare, so this is a pretty substantial group of expertise. Ionians, remember, made their entire living from trading across the Mediterranean. Now, everybody in this battle is using a pretty similar style of ship. This is because seafaring peoples of the eastern Mediterranean are constantly switching shipbuilding lore and engineering best practices. They're also switching workers. Workers are coming from port town to port town to port town to work on ships. So there's not a lot of difference between a Persian ship and a Greek ship. And this is going to become really important as this battle goes down. So the Athenians and the somewhat smaller Spartan fleet jump out from behind this promontory to catch the Phoenicians and the Ionians against this point here, against the land. And the Persian fleet has made an error in that it sent too many ships in too quickly into too narrow a strait. So the smaller Athenian and Spartan fleets are an advantage because they're not running into each other and they have room to maneuver. The Phoenicians and the Ionians, they, they don't. They're running into each other, and they're also having a lot of trouble figuring out who is who because their fleet's are dang large. It's really hard to recognize one ship from another ship. So what ends up happening is that Artemisia, who you may remember from last unit, she's in command of her flagship on the water here. Uh, Xerxes, by the way, is sitting up on a hill watching this all go down, and he he can see Artemisia's ship. She realizes she's trapped. She needs to get her people out. So she makes a bold move. She turns around and rams some of the Persian ships out of her way and then escapes back out to sea. Now, Xerxes watching this from the hillside says, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, my, my dude commanders are really sucking, but man, my lady commander's better than all my dude commanders, which is just a, a lovable moment. Of course, Herodotus is probably saying this because she's his hometown hero, but I don't care. She's cool. So she escapes. And you may wonder if she got into trouble for this. She does not. In fact, Xerxes gives her custody of his two sons so that they can get back to Persia safely for after this debacle. And that's what she does. She takes Xerxes' son back to Persia and continues to have a long, happy reign, badass that she is. This uh, works out real great for Artemisia and also for the Athenians. They managed to rout the entire Persian fleet effectively thus reducing the Persian land army to a stranded land army caught on the promontory where Athens lies. And although they try to make inroads in the next campaigning season, they're eventually defeated at Plataea. They retreat, they go home, and the Athenians go back to Athens and rebuild which is a dramatic rehearsal, right? To go from having your entire city burnt down to getting in a boat, beating the Persians, and then getting your city back. It's pretty remarkable. And just like with Marathon, Athens never shuts up about this either. But Athenians are returning to a devastated city. Their temples have been ripped apart stone from stone. Their Wealthy people's houses are utterly destroyed. Their olive trees have been cut down, and it takes forever to grow mature olive trees. It is just a massive disaster that it takes Athens a while to recover from, although not maybe as long as you might think. More about that next unit. Here's another map of the encounter. Uh, this reconstruction has the Athenians a little bit further in, but it's close enough you can see what's going on. Uh, also, this map I like because it's got Xerxes' command post on the map, so you can see where he's sitting and watching all of this and getting a little bit confused as to whose ships are ramming whom. Sat, at least for me, though, poignantly, on the island of Svitalea, the Persians who were stationed there to kill stray drowning Athenians end up coming under attack by the victorious Athenian allies, who then raid the island and kill all of the Persians to a man. So that's 
was a bad day at work for them. 